Name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Tonight, when we read the Gospels, we get mixed feelings. Feelings between those who loved God, like the woman that gave the very expenses, very expensive fragrant oil to our Lord Jesus Christ to anoint him for his burial. And on the other hand, his own disciple who went and betrayed him. So we, we stop and think between these two characters and between those who, as we read earlier as well, they called our Lord Jesus Christ that he's mad and demon-possessed and crazy. So we, th we see that people have had different opinions about Lord Jesus Christ and people saw him in different ways. Some people saw him as a good prophet. Some people saw him as a man doing good deeds. Some people saw him as mad and demon-possessed. Some people saw him that he's breaking the Sabbath because he's doing miracles during the Sabbath like the Pharisees. Some sinners come and, and pour oil on his feet and on his head and one of his 12 chosen disciples goes and betray him. So if you can just imagine the mixed emotions and the, the difference between what, how do we see our Lord Jesus Christ and from who is he to us. But if we look more closely into the character of Judas Iscariot, we find this is a very puzzling character. You know, I tried to stop and think about what was going, going on in his head. Like, what was he thinking about? If you go back from the very beginning, you'll see how this was a very significant event and something that no one expected. No one expected that one of his 12 disciples will actually betray him and will be the one that will go and actually hand him over to his enemies. Even the other 11 disciples never crossed their mind. Never crossed their mind. And they were treating Judas like one of them. Because he was one of them. No one would even think for a second that he would do something like this. This is a great betrayal. This is not something that should be taken lightly. And if we look at the way that Al what our Lord Jesus Christ did to Judas and what Judas did in return to him, we think, what went wrong? What did go wrong? What did our Lord Jesus Christ do to deserve that treatment from Judas? What did he do to get in return what he got from Judas? Let's look from the beginning. How did our, what did our Lord Jesus Christ do? He chose him one of the 12 disciples. He actually handpicked him. He selected him by name. You come and follow me. Out of these people, all these people that are around him, he chose 12 and Judas was one of them. So he was selected from a great multitude. And we have to remember something that we always forget. Many people tried to follow Christ and tried to be one of his disciples. And some of them, he told them, no, don't follow me. No, you stay. Remember these stories? A few people, he told them, no. He said, I want to follow you. He said, no, don't follow me. Go and do this. I want to follow you, no. And he, he actually rejected some few people from following him. But he chose Judas. And he gave him favor over all these people that maybe they would not have denied him. They not betrayed him. But he chose him. Not just that. He gave him the position of a treasurer. So he gave him a position of trust. He handed the money to him and said, you take care of the money. And he knew that Judas loved money. So what do you think he was trying to do? He's saying, well, you love this, take it. You're in charge of it. Maybe this will help you try and, 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 and get rid of that love of money that you have in your heart. I'm giving to you. I'm not going to hide this money from you. You're in charge of it. You deal with it. But I want your heart and take the lust for money out of it. But Judas did not heed to that. Not just that, we know that Judas, believe it or not, did miracles. Judas actually did miracles. He healed the sick. He cast out demon spirits from people. And we know that from many gospel accounts, when the disciples returned back to our Lord Jesus Christ, and they told him, 
We did miracles in your name. We cast out demons. We healed the sick. And they were so happy. You remember that time? They were so happy. And he told them, don't be happy about the fact that he did miracles. But be more happy because your names are written in heaven. Remember that story? Who was these disciples were talking about? Judas was one of them. Imagine Judas. That Judas, same Judas, he did miracles. So it's very confusing. It's very confusing. Someone who has reached a level, not just that, he was with our Lord Jesus Christ in discipleship for more than three years. He was taught by him. He listened to all his sermons, to all his talks, to all his teaching, in private with the disciples and in the big multitudes. So what's his excuse? What is his excuse? And this is why it's very puzzling. And we see even after all that, even after he still planned and with the Jews to the scribes and the Pharisees to hand him over and betray him, still our Lord Jesus Christ was trying to give him last chances, give him a chance after chance, and try to warn him that he knows. He's trying to tell him, I know what you have planned, you know, go back, rethink your plans. He was trying to give him chance after chance to change his plans and to wake up from what he was doing. But he never changed his mind. And he went further and further into his wicked plans. And this is very surprising for us. And when we, the mention of the word Judas is carried, everyone get this feeling saying, no, don't mention his name. He's, no way, no, no way I want to be like Judas. No way I want to be like him. But then some people would say, some people would argue, okay, well, well, the prophecies said that someone's going to betray our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone's going to hand him over. So it's not really Judas' fault, is it? It's not his fault. You know, he, that was a prophecy, so it's, what's his fault? Of course it's his fault. Because God's foreknowledge does not mean that he controlled Judas' actions. God's foreknowledge does not take away from us our free will. God knows what's going to happen in the future. But we are free to make any decision. But God knows what decisions we're going to make, but he doesn't make decisions for us. This is a very important concept because some people are very confused about this. Otherwise, God will be unfair. And then Judas doesn't, doesn't deserve you know, that bad name that he has now if he had no choice. But he had many choices. He had many opportunities to go back on his plan. And he never did that. So he did this free and willingly out of his free will. And he did this with a full conscience, with no, uh, with no pressure from anyone. And it all came from inside, from his desire and love for money. So we cannot say that God imposed that in him. No. We are free and we are responsible for our actions. And that's why God will never ever take our freedom away from us. will never take our free will away from us. Because this is what makes us, one of the characteristics that makes us in his image and likeness. So he can't say, I created you in the image and likeness, and he takes away our free will from us. Then we are not created in his image and likeness. But the fact that we are, that means we are completely free, and we have our free choice. And that's why we are accountable for our deeds. And that's why everyone will say, everyone will be rewarded or punished according to their deeds. And this is a very clear concept that we have to, we have to understand. So Judas was basically the author of his works. He is the one that decided to do that. So if we look at what he did compared to what our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we, we look at ourselves and say, okay, I'll never be in his position. I'll never do that. I'll never betray him. And you know what makes it even worse? That he betrayed him not for a big sum of money. 30 pieces of silver, that was the price of a slave. So he didn't just betray him and sold him for money. He sold him very cheaply. That tells me that how much he valued his master. You know, if you sold him for a million dollars, you say, okay, well, it's worth a million dollars. But he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. So that shows us how much he valued Jesus Christ, which makes it even worse. All he cared about is the money. And if we heard from the readings of the last gospel, can you just imagine what do you think the reaction of the Pharisees and the scribes were when Judas went to them. Because he went to them freely. And that's the point I wanted to, 
to uh, confirm. He's the one that went to them freely. He's the one that initiated that. No one came and approached him and said, you know, we have a deal for you. What are you going to, how much do you want? No. He's the one that approached them. He's the one that went to them and asked them and put the idea in their mind. How much are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? This is a very severe way of betraying someone. He initiated it because I'm sure that no way on earth the Pharisees and the scribes would ever imagine that one of his disciples will do that. And that's why the Bible said they were glad. And I'm sure they were very surprised and shocked when he came to them. And then that raises the question for me. Do I sell my master? Do I betray my master? Do I sell him and betray him cheaply like Judas did? And I'm sad to say the answer is yes. We do that many times without even realizing it, without even thinking that what we're doing is similar to what Judas is doing. I'm sure we heard this before many times, but sin in its core is a betrayal of God. Why? Because sin is a separation from God. So if we, when we commit a sin, we're in effect saying, God, I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm separating myself from you. I'm deciding I've made a, a decision that I'm going to separate myself from you by sinning and I want to go in a different way from your way. So by sinning, I'm actually betraying God. I'm saying, I'm, I don't belong to you anymore. I'm away from you. I'm going away from you. I'm taking a different route. Not just that, how many times we actually betray God in a different way when it comes to, for example, our works actually deny our faith. We may believe in God. Judas believed in Jesus Christ. Many people believe Jesus Christ, but when it comes to actually doing works, then it's different. Then it's a different story. We all of us believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is God. We all can say it. We all can confess it with our mouth. And we said it before, that's not enough. People say, Lord, Lord. He will say, I don't know you. But we're saying, Lord, Lord, well, I don't know you. Because your actions do not reveal your faith. Your works do not reveal your faith. So how many times do we actually say this? How many times we say, yes, I confess and I believe that Jesus is God, but my actions do something different. My actions say completely something different. You know, the way I speak, the way I act with people, the way I deal with people, the way I offer my help to people. The way I say, well, I love God, but I don't love people. When I'm self-centered, I can only see myself and what's a benefit to me. And this is something very important. Because people follow, many people follow Christ, and Judas was one of them, by the way. Follow Christ to benefit from him, from his fellowship with God. I follow God because he's going to bless my life. That's what Judas did. Judas said, I've got the money box I can benefit from him. And the gospel account tells us that he was a thief. He used to steal money from the box. And he was, you know, part of the, of the famous, you know, big, you know, disciples, big group of Christ. And they were very famous and they're very popular and they're doing miracles. And everyone was following them. So he was part of this glamour and glory. So to him, his fellowship of Christ was to benefit. There's a benefit to it. There's a materialistic benefit or a, or a pride or glory or honor. That was what I was getting out of it. And the question for us is how many of us follow Christ to benefit from him? And the way to look at this is how many times we say the word blessing. And we don't understand what blessings mean. We're saying I'm going to go to church so God can bless my life. And then we translate blessing into I've, I've got $10 in my pocket. God's going to bless it and make it $100. That's a blessing. You know, God's going to give me a better job. That's a blessing. God's going to buy me a better house. That's a blessing. I'm going to get a, a better this, a better that, and, and, and all this stuff. And we think that's a blessing. So I'm going to follow Christ, and he's going to bless my life. What a wonderful life. I'm deceiving myself. If the reason why I'm following Christ is under the pretense that you know, I love him, but I'm actually trying to get the blessings. And my understanding of blessings is actually wrong to start with. Then that's a problem. Because look around us in the church, all the saints that we have in the church. 
if we look at their life, if we look at the each individual life of the saints, do you think they had an easy life? Do you think their life was very comfortable and they had everything they wanted and, and everything was going fine with them and they had it easy? Of course not. Every individual saint, we read their story, they struggled so much. They went through difficulties, hardships, persecutions, illnesses, rejections. So where's the blessings? Where's the blessings? To us, we can't see any blessings. We can't see any blessings. But in these difficulties, there are blessings. And in following Christ by just being a son or a daughter of Christ, that's the biggest blessing that we can ask for. That God has saved us. What more blessings do we ask for? That God has saved us and gave us another opportunity, gave us a chance so we can go to Him, with Him, to be with Him in heaven. What a better blessing than that. All the other stuff are just a bonus. If they come, it's good. If they don't come, we still thank God. It's the same thing. But for me to, to follow him based on that, it doesn't work like that. Even in, um, in, the gospel, in, in the gospel accounts, if you remember the story of the young rich ruler, and he came and our Lord Jesus Christ told him, you lack one thing, go sell everything you have and go and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he went very sorrowful because he was very rich and he couldn't do that. Straight after this story, what happened? The disciples told him, look, we have left everything and followed you. St. Peter mainly started it. We have left everything and followed you. What are we going to get in return? You know, our Lord Jesus Christ said in return, whoever left a house or a brother or a sister or a wife or a husband or etc., etc., will get... You know, a lot, you know, a lot of blessings with this. And in the middle of it, he said, persecutions. He added the word persecution in the middle of, of all these blessings. You know, we'll get houses and lands and all this and persecutions. That does not match. Persecutions does not, it's not the same as everything else he was talking about. Why? Because there's blessings in persecutions. He just threw in persecution in the middle. Because we need to understand that persecution is actually a blessing from God. And that's why we need to ask ourselves tonight, are we indirectly betraying God by following him to obtain some sort of a benefit? Because that's exactly what Judas did. Am I following Christ seeking blessings? And my understanding of blessing, is it materialistic things? Is it, is it money? Is it jobs? Is it relationships? Is it status? Is it glory? Or to me, blessing could be a tribulation or a persecution or an illness or a suffering. That's a blessing as well. Depends what's my definition of blessing. And I ask everyone tonight to reconsider our why we're following Christ. To reevaluate and be honest with ourselves and go deep down into our hearts and say, what am I following Christ for? What am I following Christ for? Because am I following Christ truly for who he is? not his gifts, then I'll be able to follow him all the way to the cross. Whether he looks weak, whether he looks strong, whether he's doing miracles, whether he's being arrested, in every situation in my life, I'll be able to follow Christ without waiting for any, expecta with, with no expectation, with nothing in return. Because the fact that we are called by his name, the fact that we're given the, we were baptized and we're given the opportunity to be called his sons and daughters. That's the biggest blessing that anyone can ever imagine. Glory be to God forever.